Okay, this video is uh, chapter 25, What is Intelligence? You know, part of this book is about how to raise IQ. It's from this book about how to prevent dementia and raise IQ. It's mostly, of course, about how to prevent dementia, dementia, but raising IQ also is part of what builds your cognitive reserve to protect you from dementia. And I just noticed that, you know, I got a lot of experience with this uh, academic stuff and trying to increase IQ. You could really help yourself a lot, so it's like, why not do it? Okay. So let's pull this back here. Because I've seen lots of people who, you know, didn't seem that smart and ended up really developing themselves intellectually, academically. And I've seen a lot of other people who are super smart, really smart people who just screwed up their lives and screwed up their academic ability with all their bad habits, you know. Um, all right, so a couple quotes. The first one is Alfred Brunet, inventor of the IQ test. He said, with practice, training, and method, we can increase our attention, our memory, our judgment and become more intelligent. So yeah, you can make yourself smarter. Okay, we can get all fitting in here. All right, so the next one is um, Theodore Dalrymple. He says, the British are barbarians camped out in the relics of an older and superior civilization to whose beauties they are oblivious. And so what I get from that is you don't want to go with the herd. You know, average person, they just are shaped by their environment and whatever their environment, whatever direction it points them in, they just go with that. But if you ever want to be really good, excellent, you have to try to develop your mind and your understanding of things so you can perceive them in an objective way. Um, that's one reason why I often thought that people who had, you know, grown up in another country were smarter than somebody who just grew up in America in general because they would have that perspective of their original birth country to compare and contrast with what they would learn, you know, when they came to the United States. Okay, a quote from Charles Darwin, even people who aren't geniuses cannot think the rest of mankind if they develop certain thinking habits. And that's true. Certain thinking habits make a person smarter. So you want to try to develop these things if being smart is important to you. And I think it is because you're going to need it for everything else you do. Okay, Neil Stephenson, the author. The difference between stupid and intelligent people, and this is true whether or not they are well-educated, is that intelligent people can handle subtly. Yeah, that's a sign of somebody who can have an intelligent conversation. They can handle it. They can handle the nuance. They can handle being contradicted. He continues, the difference between being ignorant and educated people is that the latter know more facts. But that has nothing to do with whether or not they are stupid or intelligent. Yep. Okay, we got better stuff than that coming up here. Okay, Mary Pettibone Pool. I think this is a good one. To repeat what others say requires education. To challenge it requires brains. Yeah, that's right. The smartest person's out there, you know, like somebody McDougal who's going to turn something upside down, that takes a lot of brains to do. It doesn't take a lot of brains to just, you know, memorize something for a test and copy it down. I mean, it takes some ability. Certainly it does, but it takes a lot more ability to transform a field. Okay, general IQ, also known as G, or the G factor, is a way of quantifying intelligence variability among people. It is the best established, most predictive, most heritable mental trait ever discovered in psychology. Whether measured with formal IQ tests, or assessed through informal conversations and observations. Intelligence predicts objective performance and learning ability across all important life domains that show reliable differences. So IQ is a very real thing. And Jordan Peterson has talked about this a lot, that there is such a thing and it is a real thing. But, you know, again, I would say that one thing that all the university guys are wrong is about saying that you can't improve it. Like Benet said, you can improve it a lot. And I also remembered when I was uh, like a junior in high school, all I cared about was sports. Uh, that, at that time, I thought I was going to grow up and be a wrestling coach. And um, so I took the SAT. I didn't even, you know, I went out the night before. I just considered it a hassle, something I had to do. And I did reasonably well, but... I never even thought about it. It was irrelevant to me. My parents were fuzzy foreigners. I never even took an AP class in high school. So I didn't, so I wasn't tuned into it. And then I, I got injured. I couldn't wrestle for a while and I joined cross country. I'm hanging around with all these cross country guys who did really well and they did better than me on the SAT. And I was jealous. I was pissed off. I'm competitive. So I took it three more times on my own. Or I think I took it two more times on my own. And my score went up almost 300 points. And what I'm saying was, there's no change in my brain. Um, I had just pursued it. I just bought the book and studied it on my own. 
And then the same thing like when I went to Stanford, my first semester I was afraid I was going to flunk out and I got like two B minuses or something in easy classes, taking a light load of credits. But um, I was kind of freaked out that I had gotten injured again. I don't know if I'm ever going to wrestle again. So I'm like, gosh, I got to get good at school. So I hung out with a really uh, kid. I found a kid who was doing great and asked him to teach me how to study. I took a study skills class. And, and by the next year, I was getting A pluses in the most difficult classes. But the point I'm saying is there was no difference in my intrinsic genetic brain. I just simply had made an effort and studied the methods of learning. Okay, here's a good quote by Ian Fleming, the guy who wrote James Bond. Uh, all the greatest men are maniacs. They are possessed by a mania which drives them forward towards their goal. The great scientists, philosophers, religious leaders, all maniacs. What else but a blind singleness of purpose could have them in the groove could have kept them in the groove of purpose. Mania is as priceless as genius. And what I'd say from this is I've seen lots of great achievers, and that's a characteristic trait, is that they're super ultra focused on their thing and they're kind of you know, one-dimensional quite often. And the way you could think of it is, I've seen some women write really great books when their child was sick, and then they did everything they could to save their child. And the books that come to mind would be The Calcium Connection by Brune de Brody, and she, you know, hired some scientists and studied herself, and they figured out it was due to uh, circa inhibitor enzyme. And then uh, another one would be that lady who wrote Fat, Stressed, and Sick. That's that uh, biochemist, uh, Catherine Reed. She's got a TED Talk. The other lady's got YouTube videos too, Bruna Brody. Um, but uh, Catherine Reed, she won. She was a she was a protein biochemist to begin with, but she figured out her kid was real sensitive to glutamate. Took him off all the the glutamates, and the kid recovered from autism. Uh, so it's R E I D, Catherine Reed. That's good stuff. So what I'm trying to say is that drive to solve a problem dramatically increases a person's ability. So you want to get yourself into a mindset mindset where you've got that. And you'll be able to perform way beyond what you uh, would otherwise. Okay, so a little bit about what is intelligence. Um, you can define it as the ability to understand, uh, the ability to understand something, to get the gist, to understand quickly, um, to recognize patterns. And I've noticed some people understand stuff really quick. They got a high, let's just call it a genetic IQ or whatever. They understand stuff fast. But what I notice about a lot of these people is they have what I would call a materialist mindset. Look, they just want to make their money and go home early. And yeah, it's nice that they can understand fast. They have that high intelligence in that sense. But they really don't care. And so they don't learn anything more than what they had to to study their tests. But they have this ability genetically to understand complicated things relatively quickly. Um, another sign, you know, there's a lot of ways a person can get to intelligence. Ability to learn from experience. Okay, ability to apply the knowledge to future behavior, ability to think abstractly. So the point I'm kind of going through all this is it isn't just ability to answer, memorize stuff for a Scantron test, which people tend to think of as intelligence just for school. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff can obviously be developed. Okay, ability to create a more accurate model of the world, like the Feynman study technique as you progressively build a more accurate model of a subject. Ability to see connections between seemingly disparate items. Ability to perform the task, to solve problems in that field, in that domain. Okay. Okay, ability to succeed at accomplishing one's goals in life. Um, you know, and to motivate oneself enough to push through. Motivation is a giant part of uh, success and of real learning. Like I said, these women who save their kids' life because they're motivated. And the women who save themselves from, um, you know, metastatic breast cancer, like Ruth Heydrich. Most people, when they get cancer, they just go to the oncologist and they sit there like a passive sheep. The ones who really do incredibly well are the ones who, you know, like Janet Murray, she wrote the book Raw Can Cure Cancer. Ruth Heydrich, okay, uh, she wrote several different books. Okay, uh, including Senior Fitness was a good one of her books. <clears throat> okay, so intensity of purpose is one of the strongest predictors of success, and that's what I've seen too. And also this idea of, like, geniuses in particular. I studied all these biographies of geniuses and stuff. They're hyper-focused to the point where they seem a little crazy to other people, and I, that's why I'm starting to say is if you were to exclude a genius based on them being crazy or them being a little bit, you know, deficient in one area or rude or narrow or whatever – you would end up having no geniuses to study because they're all kind of crazy in some way. That was a recurrent theme. Okay, an ability to control one's emotions, behave in one's self-interest, follow through, be motivated, blah, 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 navigate a domain, okay. And then verbal intelligence, you know, can make funny jokes and rhymes and puns 
And a lot of the people who are really good at that, they're not good at school. They don't care about school, but they're actually really bright. <clears throat> okay, ability to perceive and describe. Also, it comes from reading a lot. Uh, person who, I've known some people who were really clever and funny when they were in a phase in their life when they were reading a lot. And that same person, once they quit reading, they were no longer so funny. They no longer had that zip and zest and their ability to come up with words. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's a sign of somebody who's really good in the field is they can make sophisticated observations, can perceive them and describe them, can see the deeper connections. Those are signs of a real expert. Okay, personality skills. The motivation comes from within. And I like that. I remember seeing that movie Chariots of Fire. And there was a line in the movie where one of the main characters says, where does a man find the strength to run the race to the end? It comes from within. And that's why in the long run, if you want you know, great achievement, you have to have this burning desire inside. Like you know, uh, Goethe had said, <clears throat> in order for a man to learn a complex thing, he has to love it. Okay, um, eagerness to excel. All right, so a lot of people are motivated externally by trying to get a good grade or make money. And they might learn enough to get by, but they never achieve greatness. Okay, willingness to focus on a goal, avoid distractions, tenacity about learning, curious, making playful, having a playful sense of humor enables a person <clears throat> to enjoy it more, which helps them to pursue it longer. Being nonconformist. Conformity almost always means mediocrity in a lot of common modern things. Somebody who's curious, that's a sign of them being intelligent. Okay, reading it for pleasure in one's free time is a fast way to increase verbal intelligence. Okay, then here's another thing along these lines, <clears throat> the idea of thin intelligence, you know, kind of the Michael Crichton thing. That guy was a real genius. He's an interesting guy. Um, he says they're technicians. They don't have intelligence. They have thin intelligence. They can think narrowly. They don't see the consequences. And I would actually say the modern world kind of trains people to be this way, to their detriment. You know, like they frown on a liberal arts education. Liberal arts education meant education for a free man. You know, the slave just learns a technical uh, task back in the Roman days, for example. Okay, here's a quote by W. Edwards Demings, like an efficiency expert. Experience by itself teaches nothing. Without theory, experience has no meaning. Without theory, one has no questions to ask. Hence, without theory, there is no learning. And the relevance of this quote would be that if you want to get the best possible results in health, you should have some understanding of what's going on. That's why I talk about blood flow. Everything in your body works better with blood flow. Then you should understand that high fat diets, the fat sticks the red blood cells together, makes the blood thicker, so the heart's pumping you know, a milkshake instead of pumping water. Blood pressure is gonna go up and there's problems associated with that. Plus, the thick blood makes it harder for the red blood cells when they're all stuck together like in a triple decker submarine sandwich trying to pass through those capillaries. The RBC is seven microns, capillary is about five microns. So it's harder for them to pass through and that drops the oxygen delivery to the tissues like the Peter Quo paper of that drop in oxygen delivery to the tissues 15 to 20 percent. Um, and then the Roy Swank saying he even had a study in hamster brains where he got as much as a 30 percent lowering of the oxygen in the brain parenchyma when the person had eaten a high fat meal. You'll also get vasoconstriction from sodium that's going to decrease the amount of uh, blood flow to the tissue. So that's easy. Anything you want to heal, improve blood flow. So minimize your dietary fat, minimize your dietary sodium. You understand the theory of it. Now you can intelligently think about it and what to do. And that's why I said it matters for all these other diseases. What's the theory of causation for autoimmune disease? Leaky gut and then a few other things. You know that and then you could avoid them. So you want to understand the theory of a disease you're interested in. Okay, uh, Aristotle, intelligence is more than the knowledge of a task. It is also the ability to perform the task. A shipbuilder builds ships. Okay, <clears throat> Edward de Bono, he's a clever guy. He wrote a lot of stuff on thinking skills. Intelligence is something we are born with. Thinking is a skill that must be learned. Unless we have complete information, we need thinking in order to make the best use of the information that we have. Nietzsche, intelligence is a moving team of metaphor. Part of, of becoming an expert in an area is you build up a series of metaphors on how to perceive that area so you can more quickly navigate that domain. Plus, they give you a scaffold to which you add new information. For every new thing you learn, the way you do it is by associating it with something that's already in your brain, a category, a concept, you know, same, different, opposite. Okay, now here's one of my favorite quotes of all time on <clears throat> thinking. There's always, a person always has two reasons for doing something, a good reason and the real reason. And you'll see that all the time when some higher up 
person or a hierarchy or authority figure or institutional place, they tell you, this is what you have to do or we want you to do and here's the reason. And they'll give you some reason which on the surface of it sounds nice, okay, or reasonable. But in reality, the real reason will be over here, and it's a lie, and it's BS, and they're trying to trick you, trying to get you into doing something that's not in your best interest to rip you off, take your money, or some other way it's not to help you. And so that's why you need to always ask yourself this question. Okay, what they're saying, that sounds pleasant, nice, whatever, but what's the real reason they want to do this? And that's very important. That's part of the reason why you know people say something to me, why do I sometimes make fun of conventional medicine? Because you have to understand where it's coming from, its pursuit of money, its real motives. Otherwise, you'll make yourself a chump and get ripped off, you know? It's like the joke, what's the difference between a, a doctor and a lawyer, okay? A lawyer will rob you. A doctor will rob you and potentially K-I-L-L, -L, okay? So, you. That's why, you know, it's a joke, a little bit vulgar, but I think you get my point. Don't be a chump. And the way you be, you not be a chump is to understand the deeper reason for why things happen and what's actually going on. Okay, here's another quote from Edward de Bono. And I love this quote. This really helped me a lot, this one in life. Most mistakes in thinking are mistakes in perception rather than logic. Because I would have these problems, social problems or whatever, where I would think and think and think about it, and I just couldn't solve the problem. And then what I realized was, Okay, actually, I, I combined this quote with these three all go together. These are three of the most important quotes you'll ever hear in your life about thinking. And I spent a lot of time in my life trying to think about complex things, mostly medical, nutritional, but other complex things. And in the past, more social stuff. Now nah, I'm an old guy. Social stuff doesn't matter so much. But anyway, so here's De Bono's quote. Most mistakes in thinking are mistakes in perception rather than logic. Edward De Bono. And then here's the Ayn Rand uh, correlate to it. If you think there's a contradiction, then recheck your premises. So what I started to do when I was having a difficult time thinking my way through a complex problem is I just go, what are my assumptions? What am I assuming here? How else can this be seen? And once I did that, I started to solve really complex problems. So that really helps. So if you make the assumption, like a typical patient, they go to the doctor and they assume the doctor is trying to help them, trying to cure them. And I've told you before, most of the time, the patient is irrelevant. They're irrelevant. They don't matter. No one cares about you. All they care about is do they meet that standard of care so they can bill for it and they can't get in trouble. And that's why I like some of these people who I mentioned in these other lectures because they were really acting in the patient's interest. I like Kelly Brogan. She really acted in the patient's interest even though I don't think she knows that much about nutrition. Okay, She does know a lot about other things. She probably knows more now than she did when she wrote that book years ago. We all learn as time goes by. But that makes a big difference. Is that person acting out of love for you? out of true desire to help you, or are they simply acting, going through the motions to make their money, okay? That actually ends up mattering, okay? Okay, we're almost done with these quotes here. Just wanted to get past these because they're going to build a base for topics to come. Okay, a genius is someone who transforms their field. Yeah, I love that quote about Simonton. And so if you want to be a genius in your field, you have to figure out how can you transform the field, make the entire field better, okay? And that's why, again, I'll say the people who've really transformed things in nutrition is, you know, McDougal, you have to eat starch. That's a big deal. T. Colin Campbell, animal protein is the most important cause of cancer. That's a big deal, okay? Caldwell Esselstyn, low fat, low sodium, plant based diet with no nuts and no oils, that can cure coronary artery disease. That's a big deal. Uh, transform those fields, okay? Um, so Ayn Rand, the purposeful discipline use of his intelligence is the highest achievement possible to man. And again, she echoes Aristotle. Aristotle says, you know, philosophers are the best men because the mind is the most thing most like God. Okay, so, you know, and everybody is always going to say whatever they do is the most important thing. People like to praise their own thing. That's human nature. Okay, so here's the Ayn Rand quote. In order to live, a man must act. In order to act, he must make choices. In order to make choices, he must define a code of values. In order to define a code of values, he must know what he is and where he is. He must know his own nature and the nature of the universe. He needs philosophy. He needs philosophy. He cannot escape this need. His only alternative is whether the philosophy guiding him is to be chosen by his own mind or by chance. Yeah, if you don't figure out and reason out your metaphysics, you're basically just, you know, floating along the wave of your current culture. 
So that's a magnificent culture. Okay, and also somebody asked me about Ayn Rand. You know, one of my commenters said different things about Ayn Rand. And I can tell you, if you if you care at all about Ayn Rand, the book to read is Romantic Manifesto, where she summarized her insights on what creates great art and great literature. And the conclusion she came to was the most magnificent time of all was especially like the 1800s, also the Renaissance, but the 1800s were just magnificent for multiple reasons. And she's right. If you look at the art, like I have lots of beautiful paintings with all my videos, I'll show them, you know, these old paintings. And you'll see that more than half of them all come from those 1800s. I would say probably about two thirds of them. Okay, and a lot of it came out of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and everything that goes with that. And Ayn Rand kind of reminds me of John Ruskin. I don't know if you know John Ruskin's, but he was sort of the leading philosopher, scholar of the Victorian Renaissance, you could call it. You could call it the Catholic Revival, you know, in the mid-1800s, the, the Tractarian Movement, all those things, okay? But John Ruskin was in the center of everything. And like her, I thought he was a little funny because he would go back and he would see the cathedrals and stuff, and he would just be in awe of them. But at the same time, you know, he was sort of a little bit of a, you know, a Scottish, Presbyterian, Calvinist type guy. So he couldn't admit that they were the best art. And Ayn Rand's a little bit like that, too. They'll say, oh, she's such an atheist. <laughs> I've got news for you. All she ever does is say how great the Catholic authors were, how great Victor Hugo is, her favorite novelist, Quo Vadis, you know, by Henry Sienkiewicz, the Polish guy, the greatest novel ever written, Dostoevsky, you know, the best after those guys, on and on and on. Reading Victor Hugo is like walking into a cathedral. That's why I joke about her being a closet Catholic, even though, of course, you know, publicly she'll stay the opposite. But that's a topic for another day. All right, uh, going on here, the next one is a quote from Nikolai Tesla, another great genius inventor. The mind is sharper and keener in seclusion and, under, and uninterrupted solitude. Originality thrives in seclusion. Free of outside influences beating upon us to cripple the creative mind, be alone. Be alone. That is the secret of invention. Be alone. That is where ideas are born. And there's a lot of truth in that. If you want to do top-notch thinking, you got to get away, you know, like, you know, far from the madding crowd, like Thomas Harvey used to say. And then you could really think. That's like where Newton did his best work in 1665, the miracle year, uh, when he's escaping from, you know, the plague and whatnot. He just spent time in Woolsthorpe and did all his thinking and did incredible things. Okay, Nikolai Tesla. All that was great in the past was ridiculed, condemned, suppressed. Okay, Alfred North Whitehead. It takes extraordinary intelligence to contemplate the obvious. All right, so anyways, those are just some quotes to, <clears throat> to go over some of the, the nuance of advanced thinking. And that's it for the chapter today. And then, then we'll start getting into some more of this, what you're expecting, you know, along the lines of cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's. And we're going to echo back to some of these things we just talked about today. Hope that was helpful or interesting.